Um, last month, the IMF produced their State of the World report, and what was most striking was how difficult they were finding it to put any sort of gloss on the prospects for the world economy. <coughs> At the very best, they talked about advanced economies uh, having a weak recovery, but later on in that document, they actually painted a different scenario where the whole of global output fell by 2% and the Eurozone fell, fell by 3.5% over the next two years. Pretty, uh, pretty catastrophic. In the US, what was being touted as a, a modest recovery has now clearly faltered and, uh, and uh, spluttered and there's hardly any uh, fall in, in unemployment. In the UK, despite for constant searches for uh, green shoots of growth, um, the British economy has gone back into recession and it's facing uh, the longest and deepest fall in output and the slowest recovery, not only since the 1970s and 1980s, but even since the, uh, the 1930s. Now, the major fault line at the moment in the global economy is clearly the Eurozone. In Spain, unemployment of nearly 25%. If you're a young person, it's 52%. If you look at the southern economies of Europe and the post-communist economies, which hardly get any sort of mention, unemployment around at 15%. So, with the exception of uh, Germany, which, as we'll go on to talk about, is, is a lot lower. Now, I think there's two really important things to understand about the Eurozone. The first is that it isn't, however it's portrayed in the media, it is not a separate crisis. It, it is a continuity of the uh, financial crisis of 2008. And secondly, what I want to look at briefly is the fact that however much money they throw at it, I'm going to argue that this can only be palliative and an elastoplast because there are very deep structural problems there as well. And the root of the crisis in the Eurozone really lies between what has emerged as the core and the periphery. The core being Germany and the periphery being actually everybody else, but particularly the economies of Spain, Portugal, um, Ireland and Greece. And how that came about was because after initiatives like the single market, um, the Maastricht Treaty and so on, Germany won in that race to competitiveness by much more successfully holding down the wages of, uh, of its workers and managed to build up um, a surplus on its balance of payments. And if I had a graph, which I don't, you can see an exact mirror between Germany's enormous surplus on its balance of payments and the deficit of, uh, of, everybody, of everybody else. Now, what this did is it left the, uh, the other countries of Europe um, in a position that was, uh, was very weak. The scale of the bailouts that they needed to prop up banking, the cost of repaying their debt, which was substantially higher, meant that they had ballooning... Um, ballooning sovereign debt crisis. So what began in May 19, uh, 2010 as a speculative attack on the Greece economy became another full-blown crisis which required the, uh, the bailing out of the, the, the euro and indeed the whole system. So the ruling class breathed a sigh of relief but by last autumn the euro crisis was back with vengeance. The interest that peripheral economies were paying on sovereign debt had escalated and there were real fears that, again, this would spill over into the banking system and bring about another um, credit crunch. So in December and again in February this year, the European Central Bank injected the most enormous sums of money into the, um, into the Eurozone, something like 1,019 billion euros. And what they did is they did it as the form of cheap loans for <coughs> long-term credit for the next three years. And that's bought them a bit of time. 
Now, I think we have to understand that this crisis is not, is not going to go away for two reasons. First of all, this enormous sum of money which was pumped into the uh, Eurozone the end of last year and the beginning of this year is actually, they hope, kicking the whole thing into the long grass. But actually what it's doing by supplying cheap credit to keep the banks afloat is it's sowing the seeds for another problem in three years' time, a wash with cheap credit and laying the foundations of possibly another, um, another bubble and asset boom. And if you've been following the news over the last couple of days, it's certainly clear that that hasn't um, helped the Spanish banking system, which again seems to be reeling from the possibility of meltdown from, uh, from bad debts. And secondly, um, the reason that it won't go away is because it does nothing to address the, uh, the deep structural problems that lie in the Eurozone. You know, that, that what's happened is that while Germany is locked into this sort of virtuous circle, although that's, that, that's from sort of uh, far from being completely stable, other countries are locked into a vicious circle whereby they can't recover because they're locked into the, locked into the Eurozone. Okay, so I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist to predict that not only will the Euro crisis not go away, economically, and, and Alex will talk about the politics, but it's likely to manifest itself in even more acute <coughs> forms. Now, the beacon of hope in the IMF report um, that they think is going to sort of save the global economy is what's happening in the emerging markets, particularly of Southeast Asia. But I think that if you look at China, then that optimism is uh, misplaced or at very best exaggerated. You know, undoubtedly, um, China is a, a critical player in the global economy, but the seeds of the way they extracted themselves from the crisis with the most enormous injection of uh, funds equivalent to 14% of GDP means that it sowed the seeds of its own, um, own instabilities and its own subprime subprime crisis. And even their own ruling class realise that it's unbalanced and unsustainable. Um, and, you know, whether or not you look at the 483 protests every day by workers um, in villages, in factories, whether you look at the 90 factory owners who absconded because they couldn't pay their debts, then there are signs of some real instabilities in the, uh, in, the Chinese, in the Chinese economy. And of course, the slowdown of that economy, which has dominated again the news over the last, uh, last couple of weeks, is again another threat to the recovery of the global economy. You know, aside from countries like Brazil and Australia, which are virtually um, sort of factories for providing the raw materials for China. Uh, America relies heavily on, on China for uh, government borrowing, and even Germany, in one calculation, owed something like half a percent of its growth to everything it exports to China. So not only the Eurozone, but also these so-called areas of, um, of growth look to be extremely, look to be extremely fragile. The political fallout from the crisis is, is absolutely huge, whether you look at the Chinese ruling class or whether you look at what's happening in Europe, but that's, that's going to be for Alex to talk about. So what I've done is provided a, a sketch of the state of um, a global economy which is teetering again on recession where there are bubbles of real crisis. And I think, apart from the details, that is largely uncontroversial. On the left, however, there is much more of a debate about the origins of the crisis and the roots of the crisis. And this is important because it's got implications for what poss possibilities the system has got for reform. There is a view 
um, which is really quite popular in some quarters, which is that the crisis is irreducibly one that is financial and that all of the macroeconomic difficulties are ultimately rooted in a, um, a crisis of finance. And some people even talk about financialized capitalism as being a completely different, a completely different beast from what's gone before. Now, of course, the financial um, sector triggered the crisis and recession, and the story of excessive lending, toxic uh, mortgages, and the way that ricocheted round the list, round the system and almost brought it down like a pack of cards, is a story that's w very well known to all of us. It's also undeniable that the complexion of capitalism has changed over the last three years, and it is characterised by what could loosely be termed as financialization. What we mean by that is the rise in which increasingly all of us, through pension funds or whatever, are drawn into the system, the way that, um, the way that, that uh, firms take on financial roles and also um, by the breathtaking scale and complexity of uh, derivatives, swaps and all those complex instruments in the, in the financial sector. So, you know, that is undeniable. But what is important is to distinguish between that as a trigger of the crisis and what is the actual cause of the crisis. And to understand what's happening at the moment, what's been happening um, since 2008, and indeed the rise of financialization itself, is we have to understand it not as a crisis of finance, but as a crisis of, of capitalism. And in order to do that, we need to go back to the 1960s when the advanced capitalist countries and actually most other countries um, experienced a decline in their rate of profit profitability. The global slumps of the 1970s and 1980s didn't provide the sort of clear out that was necessary to restore um, and reverse um, the fall in profitability and sustain a new boom. So what happened is the response of governments was to manage this relative stagnation in the system by encouraging the expansion of debt. And of course the liberalisation of finance um, and um, e expansion enabled them to do this. So what that did is it fueled an explosion of consumption of high property prices, high asset prices, which gave an illusion of wealth, which then allowed firms um, and households and governments to borrow and spend even more. So the effect of finance was to artificially boost economic growth and profitability, but in an unsustainable manner um, that repeatedly led to bubbles and the bursts of those bubbles. And perhaps the, 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 you know, a, a sign of what happened in 2008, for example, was the, uh, the dot-com bubble earlier on. And what we're seeing now is the most serious, deepest manifestation of that, of that crisis. So I just want to, um, want to finish by saying there's nothing new about this analysis. The way that the credit, um, the credit market played a crucial role in crisis was something that Marx wrote about in his theory of crisis, where he saw a link between falling profitability and crisis. And he argued that when um, the rate of profit was falling, then that encouraged speculation and overproduction. And he puts it um, really, really well. He said, if the rate of profit falls, we have swindling and a general promotion of swindling through desperate attempts in the way of new methods of production, new capital investments, and new adventurers to secure some kind of additional profit which will be independent of the general average 
and superior to it. So in other words, he was arguing that the credit system allows the development of bubbles, accentuates booms and busts in a way that doesn't warrant the, the underlying conditions of the system. So his argument, and the argument that I'm putting, I'm putting is that a fall in the rate of profit leads to <coughs> crisis indirectly and a delayed manner, and that financialization <coughs> is, is the link to that. So just to, just to finish, you know, we do need to focus on what the details are and to understand the details of the global crisis and how it's um, unfolding. But we also need to uh, understand what are the underlying causes and not just the trigger and the proximate causes. Because the political implications of that are quite profound. If it is the case that the crisis is irreducibly uh, financial, then it's not necessary to do away with a capitalist mode of production. And in fact, a recurrence can be uh, prevented by getting away with neoliberalism and financialized capitalism through a menu of you know, Keynesian monetary and fiscal policy, um, financial regulation, and even the nationalization of the fin financial sector. An analysis that the underlying causes of the crisis lie in specific and unresolved problems within the capitalist system, particularly since the late 1960s, leads to a very different conclusion. A conclusion that a system of unending, uh, uh, un unending uh, um, accumulation where crisis is inherent and not just a, a banana skin means that the system has to be done away with completely. What I want to talk about follows very directly on from what, what Jane was talking about. I particularly want to focus uh, on the point of juncture between the economic logic of the crisis and, and the politics of the crisis. And um, one of the things that Jane said in her conclusion was that um, it, if you think that the problem is simply financialization, if you have a superficial understanding of financialization and don't locate it within the, the more long-term tendencies to crisis that Marx identified, then the solution to the crisis can be a shift to a different kind of capitalism, a more regulated, kinder capitalism, and so on and so forth. And it's the, that, that kind of solution is what tends to dominate the policy debate, regulating financial markets and so more and so on. But what's interesting is that at, from, the, from the top, from the ruling class, that kind of solution um, has very little support. The dominant politics of the crisis from the top has been instead recharged ne neoliberalism. You know, this is a crisis at the very minimum precipitated thanks to neoliberal policies, but the way to deal with it is to have yet more neoliberal policies. And this is the, the, the privileged area for carrying through this kind of politics is, of course, Europe, not just the Eurozone, but our own splendid and extremely successful coalition here, here in Britain. And uh, a number of commentators have made the point that the um, Tea Party movement in the US, which is another, which are also calling for more neoliberalism, a further reduction of the state, are too stupid to recognise that where these policies are actually being carried out is in Europe, which they regard as, you know, a zone of utter decadence and... Uh, softness and you know entirely populated by welfare queens and so so on and so forth but in fact it is Europe that is the test ground for the attempt to carry through um, a radicalization of neo neoliberalism and this involves a repression of one of the key episodes in the development of the crisis which is the moment after the crash in the winter of 2008-9 where you have uh, the sudden and dramatic adoption of Keynesian measures to prevent a collapse of the financial system and to stimulate the major economies. That happened, that was crucial to preventing the crisis morphing into a slump on the scale 
and protracted nature of the slump of the, the 1930s, but it's um, not to be talked about, or only to be talked about in terms of how much money was wasted, how much more borrowing took, took place. But of course, um, Freud taught us that just because you repress something doesn't mean that it goes away. In fact, it returns. And the repressed is still very much there. But it takes the displaced form, again, this is very Freudian, of the um, kind of measures that are taken by the central banks in order to prop up the financial system. So, you know, when the Bank of England or the US Federal Reserve hold their monthly meeting, the only thing the, the financial media and their hangers-on in the, the, the business media and the financial markets are interested in is, is there going to be more quantitative easing? <coughs> The European Central Bank is supposed to be more orthodox, but as Jane uh, described, they pumped more than a trillion euros into the European financial system uh, starting just, just before, before Christmas. This, um, incidentally, illustrates something about the form that the radicalisation of neoliberalism takes, because the fact that the state is very active in the crisis but it, it doesn't take the form of governments being active, except through implementing austerity and slashing public spending and, and so on, but instead takes the form of these independent central bankers creating money and pumping it into the, to the, to the system is, um, is, a, is a reflection of the kind of restructuring of economic management that happened under neoliberalism and a restructuring that is legitimated in terms of neoliberal ideology. Because if you read people like Hayek and Samuel Britton, actually, who wrote a key text on it, he's one of the good guys now in the sense of attacking austerity, but back in the 1970s, he was a key um, neoliberal idea ideologue. Their argument was that democracy uh, is economically dysfunctional. You can't trust voters and the politicians who are at least nominally accountable um, to them uh, to take decisions about economic policy, so you transfer policy making to neutral experts. Uh, and that's the rationale for the, the way in which the independent central banks have come to play such a central role. Part of the, radi the radicalisation of neoliberalism that is being attempted is, um, a re is reflected in, this, uh, in the new fiscal regime that Germany in particular is trying to impose on the Eurozone, one feature of which would be another set of experts would be brought in to manage economic policy, which would be the courts, the judges, the lawyers. I know they're lawyers here, so they mustn't take offence um, <laughs> if I say that I think that's fairly bizarre. The European Court of Justice is going to monitor whether or not um, in member states are... Um, operating, uh, pursuing their budgetary policies in accordance with the, the, new, the new fiscal regime. This is part of the same process of draining the content from democracy by transferring um, power to supposedly new, uh, neutral experts. And of course, the so-called technical governments in Italy and Greece are another example of this process. Now, just one thing... I'd, I'd like to say about this is that I think it's a mistake to overstate the rationality of all this. I mean, there are people on the left who say this is the sort of deep logic of neoliberalism unfolding and everything that's happening in the crisis is kind of functional to the reproduction of neoliberal, ne neoliberal capitalism. I think that when one looks at how the Eurozone has been led in the past few years, you can't underestimate the factor of institutionalised stupidity. Um, and I, I would claim um, precedence, uh, I can point to the best possible precedent, which is provided by Marx in, in Capital. Jane referred to Marx's crucial analysis of the credit system in part five of Capital Volume 3. Now, uh, I've been studying the manuscript of of um, Volume 3 for my own uh, eccentric purposes. And in the, in the original draft, a big chunk of this very large ch um, part, it, I mean, it's a, a, almost a book on its own in terms of length, 
Marx originally planned to call The Confusion. And what it consisted of was lots of quotations from bankers and other capitalists giving evidence at parliamentary co- uh, inquiries with Marx's comments, uh, essentially pointing out how stupid and confused that they, that they were. So it seems to me that the, the, the role of stupidity in history <laughs> is something that, uh, that Marxists have talked about be- before. We shouldn't over, <coughs> over-rationalise what, the, what they're doing. Lukács emphasises the way in which rationality in detail you know, the attempt to create this elaborate fiscal regime in Europe, um, for, for example, um, helps to reproduce irrationality on the global scale. And that's, I think, what we're confronted with. But of course, now, and this is part of the, the, um, the kind of miscalculations that the managers of the Eurozone have made, have made, we're seeing a massive political reaction. The Financial Times has a major feature today called Seven Days That Shook Europe, uh, which starts with Hollande's victory in the French presidential election, but then goes to trace... No, actually, it starts with the near collapse of the Spanish banking system. But then it, it also talks about Hollande, and it talks about particularly Greece, Greece and so on. What we're seeing is a massive political fracturing in the, in the, in the, in the Eurozone. Um, <coughs> which represents a, a reaction to austerity, uh, a backlash against austerity. And I think we can see the pattern that's developing very clearly. The pattern is uh, the centre is squeezed. In other words, the parties of austerity are squeezed because it's the mainstream establishment, centre-right or centre-left parties in the gar- jargon of today, who've been carrying through austerity po- policies they're squeezed, and then we see polarisation further to both the left and, and the right. The most dramatic case is, of course, Greece. You know, in Greece, the, the parties of what the Greeks call the memorandum, the agreement with the IMF and the rest of the horrible gang that are presiding over the implementation of austerity in the Eurozone, the parties of the memorandum, New Democracy and uh, PASOK, get a third of the vote. Um, Syriza, the more user-friendly major party of the radical left in Greece, comes a close second to new democracy in the election. But we also see Chrissy Avdi, Golden Dawn, uh, an openly fascist party, winning 7% of the vote. That's a very, very clear case. But essentially, we see similar pattern, similar cases of the same pattern elsewhere in Europe. If we look at France, Hollande wins the presidential election. This is interpreted by everyone as a kick against austerity. But we also see big votes for Le Pen on the far right and for Mélenchon on the, on the radical left. In the Netherlands, you know, the Netherlands was supposed to be part of the hard core of the Eurozone that would stand firm on austerity. The coalition government has collapsed over the detail of austerity policies, who will benefit if, there, if there's elections. Everyone is saying, Hurt Wild- Wilders, the, uh, the far-right leader who brought the coalition down, will benefit. But the opinion polls suggest that the Socialist Party, which is um, a party of the radical left with its origins in, in Maoism, will also benefit very substantially. The... Um, um, what, it isn't an election, but what's happening in the, um, in the, in the Irish referendum on the fis- fiscal treaty, where there's a very powerful opposition involving both Sinn Féin and the United Left Alliance, is another case of this, this, kind, of, this kind of pattern. Now, if one looks at the detail of the pattern, the, uh, the extreme right takes different, different forms. So Chrissy Avgi is a hard fascist organisation. It's a street fighting organisation. It's not, there's none of this sort of Euro fascism. It's not guys or even the odd woman in, in suits pretending to be voter, voter friendly. These are hard fascists who won. And it indicates the, ex, the scale of the radicalisation in Greece, which partly reflects the absolutely devastating effect 
of austerity on Greek society, but also reflects the fact that this is a society which has been through massive social struggles, more or less continuously. Well, when did they start? The end of the Second World War. Uh, th these are struggles that have been going on a very long time. Um, in the case of, uh, of the Netherlands, builders is what we have is a, a racist neoliberal populism. And in the case of France, we have Le Pen, who dresses up fascism in voter friendly, friendly and anti globalization. So the right takes different forms, the far right beneficiaries. If we look at the radical left, it's much more uniform, actually. What we're seeing essentially is the flourishing of different forms of, of left reformism. Usually in, the, usually in the shape of coalitions, this is true of Syriza, this is true of the Front de Gauche in France and so, so on, but essentially articulating versions of left reformism. And the forces harder, uh, that are harder left uh, haven't done so well. The most serious and worrying example of this is the kind of pressure that the, the NPA, the new anti-capitalist <coughs> party uh, in France has, has, has suffered um, in, in, in recent, recent times. But if we look, at going back to Greece again, one uh, symptom of the polarisation of struggle that we've seen in Greece over a long period is the strength of the Communist Party, which is essentially a thir third period Stalinist party. I mean, its politics are rhetorically um, ultra-revolutionary, but also ultra-sectarian, which has a very strong base in the organised working class, but didn't become the main expression of the radicalisation. Syriza, which is broader, much less sectarian in, in style. Um, I mean, I would say both parties represent particular kinds of opportunism. In the case of the Communist Party, it's more defence of its organisation and its base. Syriza um, is... Um, involves forces on the far left, but also much more right-wing uh, for forces, and that gives an ambiguity to, it, to, to, its, to its politics. But it's Syriza <coughs> that is the beneficiary of the reaction against austerity. I don't think this is at all surprising. Um, if, if we look at the experiences of much bigger events than we're talking about, yeah, um, of, of actual revolutions, we see... We see people not jumping from their existing uh, traditions and beliefs um, to straightforwardly revolutionary positions, um, but finding some sort of intermediary which expresses what they think are the aspirations of the revolution, but is safer and more familiar and so on. This helps to explain the central role that the Muslim Brotherhood has, has played in the uh, development of the, the, the revolution in, in Egypt, for, e for example. In the European context, <coughs> it's therefore very understandable that people should turn to parties that are articulating essentially a traditional reformist critique of austerity and of the neoliberalism that lies behind it. Uh, and I think that uh, on, on a smaller but very dramatic scale, George Galloway's victory in Bradford West is an example of the same process. Galloway ran, as he put it, on a real Labour uh, ticket. He ran, in other words, challenging not simply the austerity of, of the coalition, but also challenging the weakness of Labour, Labour's response. And he got this astonishing, astonishing result. This is an illustration of the same, same pattern. You can also see in Britain polarisation to the right as well. UKIP did well in the, in the local elections. U UKIP has become the receptacle of a certain kind of right-wing populism that isn't simply anti-EU, but is reactionary across, across, the, across the board. Now, this, is, this, is a, this development is totally, expect, is, is totally predictable, that the reaction against uh, austerity should take the form of the growth of different forms of left reformism, but it's also problematic. Tsipras, the leader of Syriza, 
is the man of the hour. He said very good things about demanding that the memorandum is torn up, an end to austerity. But he also wrote a letter to the European Commission, which is much more accommodating. This reflects the ambiguity of the kind of politics that Syriza represents and of the contradictory pressures that it's going to come under, the better it does. I mean, there's an opinion poll that says that if there is another election in Greece, Syriza will get 27% of the vote. That means it will form a government. Now, what kind of government will it be? That's a central question. Now, this poses a, all this poses enormous challenges for the revolutionary left because... What we have to do is to be able to pr provide clarity of analysis, and that's, you know, the function partly of this, this uh, conference, is to help to promote and develop that clarity. But it has to be... Com simple, clear analysis can be articulated in total isolation and inability to influence events. If we want that analysis to influence events, then we have to be part of the radicalization, identify with it, identify and acknowledge the forms that it's taking, the vehicles, the organizational vehicles of that radicalization, but not simply liquidate ourselves ourselves into those forms. That's, that's quite a tough thing to do. Um, it's easy to say, it's much harder to, harder to do, but that's really the challenge for the, the revolutionary Marxists who don't simply want to analyse the, the logic, the forms of evolution of the crisis, but also to influence the forces that are beginning to rebel against it. We're going to bring in uh, uh, speakers to sum up now. They'll have uh, a maximum of, of seven minutes each. I'll bring Alex first. OK. Um, back on, on the question of stupidity... Uh, and I want to bring in more Freud by saying stupidity is a symptom, the kind of institutionalized sim stupidity that I t talked about. It's not just a consequence of the entrenched entrenchment of neoliberalism and the way in which neoliberalism has worked for the benefits of, of the rich and has widened the polarization but, uh, um, between rich and poor. That's part of the story, but I think it's more that there's a deep structural dilemma that the ruling class faces. And I'll try and express it as sim simply as possible. People have talked about the crisis of profitability. What is a crisis of profitability? It means there's too much capital relative to the profits, the surplus value that is extracted from, from workers. Now, there are two ways in which you can solve that problem. One is squeeze the workers harder, get more surplus value out of them. The other way, which Marx talks a lot about in Capital, is to destroy some of the capital. In other words, to get rid of some of the capital that can't attract uh, a, a satisfactory profit in cur current circumstances. What we haven't had in this crisis, and this has been true of the whole period since the late 1960s, is enough destruction of capital. What the Baylites have done is to re rescue large chunks of highly unprofitable capital concentrated in the banks. We have a situation today where, yes, there's been a huge surge in profits thanks to the, um, to the way in which workers were hit at the height of the slump, but those profits aren't being invested. 750 billion in Britain, over a trillion euros in the Eurozone, over a trillion in the United States, profits that isn't being in invested. Uh, Michael Roberts, who's here, has estimated that this reflects, certainly in the United States, a fall in the rate of profit um, as part of the, the process of, of, of recovery. Now, why don't they destroy lots more capital? Because if they do that, that would lead to a massive contraction of demand and would generate uh, a much deeper slump than anything that we've seen so far in the crisis. So you have... So it, I don't agree with the people who just say, you know, the pro-austerity faction represent the, you know, coherent interests of the ruling class. They re represent a deep frustration which arises from the failure to resolve the crisis of profitability that says, yes, let's smash them. The problem is, if they do smash the workers even harder than they have, that means a deeper slump. And 
That's why you get the vacillation, the stupidity, and so on and so forth. That's one point. Second point, just, just some, point, uh, some remarks about Germany. Mary's absolutely right. It's not Germany. It's not the German working class that is doing well. As both Jane and Guillermo Carchetti have said, the, the basis of Germans, Germany's improved competitiveness has been a massive squeeze in labour costs in Germany. In other words, a massive increase of the rate of exploitation in, in Germany. This reflects the kind of model, economic model, that Germany has, which is critically dependent on export markets. Now, here we come again to the fact of ir irrationality, that what the, what the austerity means is whacking uh, the uh, key export markets for, for Germany in, in, the, in the Mediterranean. You squeeze Greece, you squeeze Italy, you squeeze Spain, you reduce the demand for ger German exports. Now, it's true that German capitalism has been reorienting eastwards, and China is now Germany's biggest trading partner. It supplanted France earlier this year. But I don't believe that shift is, an, is enough to sustain, to, to allow German capitalism to ride through uh, the, the kind of pressure on its, its, its domestic, its export markets in, in Europe that is that is taking place. So it's quite interesting, in the days since the Greek election, you've had Schäuble, you've had both the, the Bundesbank and Schäuble, the German finance minister, saying, maybe we could do with a bit more inflation in Germany. Maybe we should allow wages to rise in, in Ger Germany. Um, because that would, if, if you allowed wages to rise, that would provide greater domestic demand for the products of German industry. The problem with that, of course, is that's asking the German bosses to accept a cut in their profits by, by increasing wages. So whether that's going to go down particularly well, it's a symptom of the, the structural dilemma that I talked about, talked about before. But I also think, I mean, when people talk about Germany being an imperial power in Europe, Doug Henwood, the American left-wing economist, uh, put it very well. He said... He didn't think Germans did empire very well. Um, and uh, he, uh, uh, he wasn't simply referring to the Second and Third Reichs, uh, he, uh, where you have essentially empires that are founded simply on coercion. But also, he argued that the German ruling class tends to relate to the rest of the Euro Europe economically without thinking about you know, what Gramsci called hegemony. You know, in other words, the political role that may involve economic concessions. And he argues that the American ruling class under, have historically understood this better with things like the Marshall Plan. And the fact that the Germans aren't managing <coughs> Europe very well, the German ruling class, may ref reflect the fact that what we're talking about at most is a very limited hegemony for Germany, which is still in the shadow of the central role that the United States played in leading Western capitalism. OK, final point. Sorry, there are lots and lots of things that have come up um, that I can't deal with. Question of, question of reformism. I mean, the, someone asked, what about the more traditional reformist parties? Now, of course, they've moved massively to the right. Social liberalism, embrace neoliberalism. That's cr helped to create the space in, we, in which we get these more left reformist parties developing. It's very important not to underestimate the reformists, though, the traditional reformist parties. Who won the French presidential election? You know, a very dull, mainstream socialist party pol politician. Labour did quite well in the council elections. One of the most interesting things for me is the way in which they s saw the challenge from the SNP in, in Glasgow. In a, 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 what, what is, um, even in Britain, although it's clear things aren't as dramatic here as elsewhere, what we're seeing is something very interesting, which is the, the, the growth that, the, the, in general, the traditional reformist parties aren't down and out. Maybe Pasok is, but the general picture is not that the traditional reformist parties are finished. But at the same time, there's a space de developing further to their left. Now, in a context like Greece, I agree that, you know, the, the, with Dave Stockin, that the, the traditional uh, idea of a workers' government or the demand, the slogan of a workers' government, has some purchase in terms of what people should be 
should be saying that Syriza should be doing. It shouldn't, if it ends up as the biggest party in the next election, it shouldn't just go into coalition with the parties of the memorandum. It should form a genuine government of the left that implements a program of measures. If you look at Antasia's program, it's actually a very good set, set of demands and so on. So I agree that we're in that kind of terrain. But a program demands without a, an organised force that can fight for the, the, that kind of politics is, is empty. And the critical question that we will have to return to, we can't deal with adequately today, is how the revolutionary left is able to place itself within this growing radicalisation so that it can influence that radicalisation and take it further to the left. Right, lots there to talk about, but I'll just finish by making three, uh, three quick points. Um, firstly, in answer to the, um, the person at the front, I think uh, the challenge of finance and economics is extremely difficult for most people. It's completely um, bamboozling. And the ruling class have got an interest in making it so. Firstly, so they can personally profit by foisting payday loans at interest rates of 2000 percent on people and um, you know also so they can make billions out of things like um, personal um, personal protection um, although I think JP Morgan probably wished that they hadn't bamboozled themselves quite so much with their big bill of uh, um, sort of billions of dollars from d deals that have gone wrong I, I think the trouble is uh, I quite often come across two sorts of people. Firstly, people who find it completely mystifying and ignore it, and other people who get completely obsessed with derivative swaps and the scale of this and can't see the, the wood, for, wood for the trees. And I'll just give a plug for Marxism Festival in July, which is really useful for taking people through some of the steps that I know some people might find a bit difficult. On Germany... I think uh, the ruling class of Germany have got every interest in staying in the Eurozone. Firstly, because of the role of their banks, although they're trying to reorientate their debts, but their banks certainly, um, that th th helping other countries is helping German banks. But I thought that uh, Giuliano raised a very um, important question about this idea of competitive devaluation. So what we mean by that is, let's say tomorrow, the Eurozone collapsed and everyone reverted to their own currency. That's a very attractive quick fix for, the, for you know, places like Italy and Spain because overnight it would give you a get out of jail free and a competitive advantage just for a while. In the case of Germany, that would be the opposite. That would be quite a big problem for them. But I think that, that, that's going to be uh, a, a, an interesting one to, to watch. Finally, um, a question that came up quite early about financialization. How do we um, explain it uh, to, to, uh, to, to people that we work with and come across? And I don't think it's particularly easy. But you know, Marx distinguished between, if you like, what's on the surface, the things that we, that we can see, the financial system, and the inner workings of the system. And that's what I think we're talking about today and we're talking about in the ne next session. That finance is um, something that we, can s that, that we can see, that we come across every day. And we have to understand how that is the trigger and not the cause of crisis. And unfortunately, it's not an argument or an understanding that we can duck. Because understanding why it is a crisis of capitalism and not simply a crisis of finance leads to very different solutions. Either the sort of Keynesian solutions of um, short-term changes in policy and even nationalisation, or a solution that says that the system is inherently unstable, has got inherent problems, and therefore we need to change the whole thing. Thank you.